Okay, welcome to Stampscaping 101. This is a scene that I just finished stamping, and this scene took a really long time because I went into it with a certain concept in mind, and uh, it's a fairly large scene. It's a half sheet, which would be um, eight and a half inches wide by five and a half inches tall. It's um, you know, half letter sized page. I was going for a kind of a, a misty, real kind of almost white out type of a scene up in the mountains that I saw a few years ago. I guess it's been two years now. And I kind of want to create something like that. Um, I did take photos of it um, and a couple of videos that are on our Flickr page and uh, you can see that, but uh, for the most part, I was just kind of, I don't know. If you try to replicate something too closely, um, inevitably it's going to be really difficult to, you know, replicate what a camera can do so much better. So it's just kind of um, referencing something in terms of the, I don't know, the mood or feel of it. Um, and uh, it's really about the mist and things like that. When I started stamping this out, I was thinking it was going to be in a different color scheme. And it ended up just, I don't know, taking a couple different turns. And, uh, I don't know, that's the, the way stamping, scenic stamping for me tends to go. I, I start off with a certain idea and uh, you just let it go in whatever direction it seems to want to go in. Um, for me, it ended up being about kind of the oscillation of uh, textures, especially in the foreground right down here. I had a grassy field if you end up watching this video. And there was a certain monotony to it from, you know, this area up here to all the way to the bottom. So I really added in some extra textures down here in the form of these kind of manzanita-ish looking, uh, I don't know, branches, and then I added in some extra um, color in here with the use of the uh, leaves off of a uh, rocks and leaves stamp, but really where it ended up taking off, I, for me, was um, the use of all these little textures in here. If you see these little green dots in here and uh, colored little um, paint and gel pen dots throughout here, creating kind of a passage of uh, I don't know, little illuminated flowers or highlights on the grass. That's, for me, um, kind of my favorite part of the scene right here. Um, kind of what's going on down here. I was going to put some kind of subject matter in here, but I thought, I thought there was just enough going on down here. You know, I don't want to create, you know, a strong focal point in terms of a... Uh, you know, a, a figure back there in the distance in the form of an animal or something like that. If I stamped a little deer or something like that, the eye would just go straight to it, which would be fine. You know, this is kind of a, like a passageway to a, you know, a perfect little setting for something like that. But I thought I just want to make this about the, uh, the trees and the texture and uh, the overall, I don't know, um, visual, um, texturing that's going on in here. So anyways, this is a super, super long video. I'll try to put some um, um, timestamps in the description below. If you tap um, show more, it'll expand the, uh, the information area and I'll have some timestamps in there if you want to fast forward to certain things like where I start coloring or where I start adding in the pigment ink and uh, then the eventual um, gel pen highlights, which are, you know, pretty close to the end of the video. But anyway, uh, I had a lot of fun with this one. Um, I had to stop several times to wait for certain inks to dry because I, there's just so much layering going on in here. And uh, I didn't want to smear, you know, kind of the impressions. So um, if you choose to watch some of this, um, I hope you enjoy it. So again, thanks for tuning in to Stampscaping 101. Okay, 
going to get around to the scene that I've been wanting to get around to uh, for a while now using the three leafless pine trees uh, in a scene maybe with some grass I pulled out some different uh, grasses here some reeds uh, to use in the scene uh, it's going to be a fairly simple scene in terms of the use of imagery um, it's a scene that I want to kind of uh, look like a, a scene that I saw um, in real life uh, when I was out camping once uh, a couple years ago and it's a scene where there was a lot of um, kind of a uh, skeleton trees from, uh, remnants from a uh, remains of a fire that happened uh, years ago but all of the trees were kind of um, they were stark white um, I'm not gonna do them like that but um, I don't know I might do something I might try something with some pigment ink but um, uh, there was some fog that came in in the late afternoon like right around dusk and uh, you can just kind of see all the fog amongst, uh, you know, kind of going, uh, traveling along the uh, the grasses and in between the trees and stuff, and it really gave it an interesting uh, look. And uh, I want to try something like that. Um, it's going to be fairly monochromatic, um, but. Uh, I'm kind of purposely not looking at the uh, photograph, you know, in terms of referencing it. I mean, I looked at it recently, but um, I don't want to try to replicate it because sometimes if you try to do that, inevitably, <laughs> I don't know, it, it doesn't, it ends up not really looking like the photograph and uh, I'd rather it be something in the spirit of uh, kind of the, the memory of a a scene or, or a visual that I've looked at before, you know, and, uh, you know, I mean, you can reference um, a photograph um, and try to kind of start off and reference it, you know, in terms of a, you know, a specific uh, appearance to something, but inevitably they all kind of take on a spirit and their own and go in a different direction anyway. I don't know, sometimes it's good to have a photograph, sometimes you can kind of pick up some new techniques um, that way when you're trying to replicate something, but um, I don't know, I, I think you should just kind of uh, let a scene kind of go in the direction that it seems to want to uh, be taking at uh, any given time. We don't have the, all the different colors, you know, that, uh, you know, the camera can uh, replicate all the, you know, the shades of gray in this case that I probably, you know, was out there that, uh, at that, uh, at that time. Um, when I mentioned fog, um, it was kind of traveling, uh, I don't know, it, it, there, there's a thick bank of it, but uh, in this case what I'm going to have it do is, uh, I'm going to have it traveling kind of a, uh, at the base of uh, all of my uh, trees, or not all of them, but uh, kind of interspersed, but but a lot of it down there. So what I'm doing is I just ink this up in black, and I'm going to take off some of the ink off the bottom of it, so that um, there's this uh, transition from. Um, wet to fairly dry down here. Um, I've removed quite a bit of the ink, but um, that should give me kind of a, a gray to light gray um, scale down in this area where it becomes very uh, dry. Okay, um, let's see here. This right here um, is a half page um, let me see, that would be a 5.5 by 8.5 inch um, card. It's fairly big, but um, to get these large trees in there, I really needed a, you know, to go with a half page instead, as opposed to the, uh, the quarter page, which is fairly standard for card making. But um, anyway, 
Um, let's see here. This is a fairly large tree. Looks like the top is going to go off the the tip of it is going to go off the top of the page of the card. Okay. All right. So you get a lot of that transition down here. It got pretty light up that way. I don't know. Maybe I need to ring my black pad, but uh, that's basically what I'm going after. It's fairly dry, but um, let's do the same thing on a, another impression. That's what one of the things about landscape stamping, amongst a, a lot of other things, is uh, the repetition of imagery and uh, how that um, applies to uh, making scenery. Is it just makes rubber stamping such you know such a perfect. Uh, medium for creating uh, you know, images from nature just because of the repetition of shape that occurs in nature. Okay, a little bit of a darker one right there, and I tell you what, let's go for I think if I want to go for another one. Let's go. Let's go for three in the foreground. So these ones are fairly, uh, you know, these ones are darks. I mean, uh, large. So these ones will end up being my foreground images. And uh, I don't know. They say that uh, in composition, you know, not every composition, but uh, Quite often things look uh, good in uh, when they come in threes. So, okay, so I'll put three of them in the foreground. Uh, let's go. Let's go about right here. I can see that uh, some of the brand, or I don't know, one of the branches might go off the page a little bit, but that's fine. Not everything in terms of uh, scenic stamping components has to be uh, limited to the, uh, you know, the interior of the, uh, the card space. So a lot of times people ask me, they say, well, what images can I use for a, uh, you know, a quarter page card? And they don't think that, uh, you know, um, this is really for beginning scenic stampers that is new to it. Um, they think that the whole stamp has to be used, you know, has to fit within the, uh, the space of the card. Um, so they, a lot of times they think that um, kind of larger stamps are kind of inappropriate for that use, but um, that, you know, happens to be the case with a lot of types of stamping, but uh, but certainly not in scenic stamping. You can stamp the whole thing. You can stamp part of it. You can repeat it many times. You can use only portions of it if you want to. Okay, let's see. This is my uh, another block with the uh, tack and peel on it. It's a little bit too small for this medium size one. This is the other, this is the next size right here. Now if I only had like this larger stamp right here, um, what I could do is I could just use, you know, a portion of it from here up or something like that um, to create a smaller tree in the background, okay? But since I have them, I might as well use them. Oh boy, this uh, this tack and peel on this block right here was getting really uh, kind of dusty and not very tacky, and I washed it off recently, so this is the first time I've used it since I washed it, but it is really tacky again. That's uh, one of the nice features of uh, 
this uh, this material. You can just kind of rinse it off and let it air dry, and it uh, really regains that uh, the tackiness practically of a you know brand new um, surface. All right. Let's do the same type of thing. Let's remove some of the ink off the base of it. You want to do this with a dry paper towel. If you do it with a wet paper towel, it takes off all of the ink, which of course we don't want to do. All right. And just composing, um, I like to kind of move things around a little bit and see what I'm doing. Um, I don't need a, a stamp positioner or something like that for, for that purpose. Okay, got a smaller one right there. Why don't we go with another one? Let's see. I don't want things so balanced, you know, like three on this side, three on this side, or something like that. I mean, you could. One time we did a uh, an exercise in a drawing class um, that was called uh, dramatic, uh, dramatic Balance and Dramatic Imbalance, where we kind of visually weighted one side of the uh, drawing, you know, heavy with the uh, large masses and something really small on the other side, and another one we did where it was completely equal, and that was called Dramatic Balance, you know, so we had, uh, you know, contrasts between the uh, the two uh, kind of compositional structures and that was a that was a good exercise I always remember that one I probably use more uh, imbalance than I do balance though when you do it so something kind of uh, so balanced on each side it kind of looks like a little doorway you know into the uh, into the uh, scene, and that's good in this case, you know, putting some kind of object back there like a deer or a, you know, person or something like that. Wildlife is a good thing to throw back there. Okay, let's see. Um, the smallest one right here is one that I can use on this smaller block. I don't know, it's kind of a medium block, but that other tree didn't fit. I usually do, I, I didn't used to do kind of long, skinny um, images back when you know everything was wood mounted because I didn't have that uh, that ratio of uh, wood that I kept in stock. So uh, kind of going with the unmounted these days, it really freed me up in terms of a uh, you know a designer being able to kind of draw whatever I wanted to do. You know, just with only the uh, the image uh, kind of in mind, and uh, I know some people still like wood mounted stamps, but um, I don't know. I kind of got spoiled, and I want to be able to kind of draw it whatever I want these days after uh, all these years of uh, designing. It's really nice to be able to kind of draw whatever you want and uh, <laughs> and not worry about the uh, kind of the format. Uh, I didn't used to have uh, things like squares either. Now I can do, uh, if I wanted to, I can do like a, a planet or something like that, or a moon, just, uh, you know, that's a, that's a square. I don't know if I've done anything yet, but... Uh, I should. I'm probably still, in some ways, when I'm designing, I'm kind of still locked into the idea of everything being kind of being a rectangle. Okay, a couple uh, images on the uh, outsides just to kind of layer things a little bit more. And uh, let's put something kind of uh, farther back. Let's remove kind of a, I don't know. I'm, by the way, I switched pads when, it, when that other pad was kind of dry, so maybe if I take off 
what I think I'm taking, you know, I think I'm taking off the same amount of ink, but the other pad just didn't apply as much ink to begin with, so I'm not quite sure how gray this is going to be. It might, sometimes I think I'm taking off a lot of ink, but then I stamp it out and it's completely black, but uh, we'll see. Okay, let's go about right here. Speaking of kind of a window, kind of an opening for some other type of subject matter, uh, that's probably what this one's going to end up looking like a little bit. Okay, let's see here. See what we're kind of going after. I can see some mist or something like that. Seem like this one would be perfect for um, something like some snow too, or something like that. Can you imagine this in all blues or something like that with a full moon out? Some shadows being cast uh, by these trees that would look really interesting as well. Maybe I'll have to do something like that or do some variations on this uh, on this theme here. Um, but I don't know. Let's uh, let's kind of stick with the theme here. <laughs> in some videos in the past, I've kind of started off saying I'm going to do something, and I don't know, it gets thrown out, you know, completely thrown out the window by the time I get 25% into the scene, then I'm not doing anything uh, that I said I was going to do. But we'll try to stick with that uh, theme. Okay, now... The trees have been stamped out. Now let's add in some um, grass textures, kind of to anchor the base of these, um, the base of these trees. Now, what I have is uh, the uh, grass texture stamp and the sedge filler stamp. A couple good kind of uh, filler stamps for uh, anything that. Uh, any type of scene that might have grass in them. One of them represents something a little bit um, closer to you. You can, you can see the, uh, uh, there we go. We can see the kind of the texture in there, right in here. And uh, kind of the negative shape of it. I didn't know if this one was gonna work out or not. Um, when I first started, des uh, when I designed it, you never know how something's going to work until you really, you know, I can have a pretty good idea, but until you use it, you you really don't know how something's going to work, and this one worked really great. And that's when I learned to kind of make things a little bit more, things used to be a little bit more exact, I guess, you know, where I, my dot placements went, and then this one was like really kind of rough and textured, and I thought that kind of, it was able to blend in better with uh, the surroundings, not having it, you know, each dot placed so uh, perfectly. So I learned a lot from that image. I like images that um, really blend well. You want usability, you want fun and all that, but, um, you know, usability in terms of uh, blending, you know, is really important with uh, Scenic stamping, of course, you know, because we don't want it to be a hassle to be able to compose, you know, in terms of uh, the usage of designs and uh, the placement of them. You want it to be really nice and easy. Like in this case, um, you know, I didn't mask at all, and that was just fine. I don't want to be able to see um, where one. Uh, impression ends and the other one begins. You want it to be kind of seamless, so that's what we have going on right here. And I just stamped it over the uh, the top of everything, um, including uh, blending in the foreground texture with the background. If I didn't have this foreground texture, if I went with, if I was doing one or the other, I would go for just the sedge, but sometimes it's nice to kind of, uh, you know, have that, you know, that contrast between that uh, kind of heavier texture and the lighter ones in the background like that. Um, but like I said, you can do it with, uh, you can do it with one or the other. Okay, I think that looks fine. I can add in some, I can add in some other hills in the background or something of that sort. And I'm still wondering if I should. See, I've kind of created this, um, the slope right here um, goes from right here like that. Now, 
I'm wondering if I should kind of create it, make it look like there's a hill going in the back. Then I could, I can kind of mask off that uh, that slope and put some other trees on the back side of it. It's not really the uh, kind of the the scene that I that I had in mind. Um, like I said, uh, I'm not sticking with it completely, but we're not being held to that. But uh, let me see. I, what it looked like was it looked a little bit more something like this. There was a you know a higher um, kind of a ridge back here. Let's do that. Let's. Well, I've already done it. There's nothing I can do. But see, I've added this extra kind of amount in here. So now the the land goes up that way. I mean, this could be like a a slope, and then it goes. You know, there's like a dip in the back of this one, and then it goes up like that. And if I want to do something like that, what I can do is I can mask off right in here and put some of their trees back there. Let, well, let's do that. I'm talking about it. Let's grab the. Uh, a small one again. In my tack and peel video that I just did, where I was uh, applying that uh, tack and peel to uh, to the acrylic block for the first time um, on one of my larger blocks, I I lost this little you know whatever protective sheet or whatever, and I couldn't find it. It was you know, like stuck. You know, somewhere someone said I need to stick put a sticker on it and uh, thank you for that suggestion uh, for uh, for the person that uh, mentioned that that's a great idea and I'm going to do that see that I need to just put a little squiggle sharpie on it or something but I but I do need to mark it okay um, let's see I'm just using this uh, this rip paper towel I'm going to mask off um, some of that slope, and we'll put some uh, additional trees back there. It's kind of layering it a little bit more, and uh, with the use of scale in terms of large and small. I think it's become a little bit uh, richer um, in terms of a, uh, a surface. The repetition of shape, you know, it's kind of getting kind of busy, but, but, it's, but it's all of the same shape, so I don't think it looks quite so cluttered as it could be if I used uh, a lot of different images. Now there's a lot of contrast working in here right now because you know I've stamped all these trees out in black and you know there's variations of gray too but um, uh, you know where it was a little bit drier but um, this should all come together a little bit more better um, with the use of uh, um, color uh, being applied to it. Now I think what I'm going to do is um, some of these trees, especially with this kind of this other pad that I switched to, it's a little bit wet, so I'm going to have to wait for this to dry a couple of minutes before I start applying some uh, color onto it. I'm going to apply a lot of color, um, or a lot of tone at least, onto the scene. So um, I think I'm going to wait for it to uh, set up a little bit. I can see there's little beads of uh, wet ink in here. Okay, even touching it right here, I've kind of blurred some of that, but that's not really going to be a big deal. It's going to be kind of a darker on the edges and kind of lighter in the middle here somewhere. Um, I'll kind of oscillate the use of a shade within the scene uh, to give it some uh, variation. Um, but that being said, let's wait for it to dry a little bit. I'll add in some foreground later on. I mean, I can do it right now since I'm letting it kind of dry. But sometimes, like I said in other videos, I kind of sometimes I like to add the foreground in last. It gives it a really crisp impression, but it also I can see where all, all the the lights, uh, the light um, lighting scheme, um, kind of uh, 
is directed uh, in the scene after I lay down all the inks. In other words, sometimes I don't want it to get so dark around um, some foreground. You know, otherwise this thing just is not going to show up. So I'll add that uh, last. So anyways, let's give this a, a few minutes to dry and uh, we'll return at that time. Okay, we're back. The scene is, uh, the composition is now dry. And it's time to uh, start applying some tones on here. I was thinking about um, what kind of color scheme I want to do on this. I could do a completely monochromatic one, uh, which is kind of the general idea, but I was thinking about doing some kind of a monochromatic, um, not really a split fountain, it's kind of where you have a gradation of tones and kind of a you know a swatch that transitions from one tone and to the other one but um, I was thinking about going for something I want this to be somewhat cool but I also want some warm elements in there and uh, I was thinking about something like these uh, this transition of brown tones here I'm not sure how much of the the medium and darker tone I'll get into these are Marvies this is a pale orange brown and dark brown if you have something similar you can use those ones um, this one's a deep lilac it's kind of a you know somewhat of a pale violet if you have something kind of closer to pink like an orchid you can use that memento sweet plum desert sand and this is a seashells peach bellini which turned into Adirondack Lights. Um, Peach Bellini, which is now discontinued, but that being said, there's other things like Distress Inks with uh, kind of those warm, lighter tones that can be used as well. All right, this isn't being real specific. I've never, I don't remember using this color scheme before, so I've just kind of grabbed a bunch of things that range, um, that have a value range from light to dark, okay? For the most part, most of these are lighter, and those ones, uh, I usually start light. Oh, this is a Memento London Fog. It's gray. I don't know how it'll look with these ones. It's somewhat of a neutral gray, so I think it would... I think it would blend just fine, but uh, you never know, you know, until you get into it. You might know a single color and how it looks on glossy paper and matte paper, but really until you start layering these together it's really kind of hard to tell but that's why I kind of you know if you put your different pads together be it something like these Marvy ones but if you kind of lay these things down you can you can get a, an idea if they'll kind of harmonize together you know somewhat it's like putting a bunch of like fabric swatches or something like that or patterns you can kind of take a look at it and if it kind of clashes and doesn't look right it might be a little bit harder to uh, incorporate into a kind of a harmonious color scheme but um, but if it looks good to your eye you know usually it uh, it goes uh, down on the paper just fine I start off my light tones and uh, this is the color box stylus tool, but any kind of sponging method will work just fine. Okay. I'm not even quite sure. Um, I was looking around to see if I had my re-inker for this somewhere, but I, I couldn't find it. But this, uh, this pad seems fairly wet. Adirondack light colors were very, very light. They were shadow stamping inks. So, uh, I don't know where they are on the, uh, the value scale between, uh, let's say, zero being nothing and 100% being kind of black. They're probably under, I don't know, 10%. They're very, very light, and I hope this is picking up on the video. I'm not quite sure. The basic thing is I'm just kind of getting the swatch down. If you're using something like a Distress Ink, it has the same type of binder. It's, it's kind of slick uh, in terms of the 
uh, the viscosity of the ink. You know, they're thick and uh, on glossy paper, they kind of just glide across the paper just uh, very easy. They're kind of slippery, as I say, sometimes. Um, the thicker the ink on glossy paper, the slower um, the absorption um, rate. So I can spread it. I can put, you know, a blob. Oops. <laughs> I can put a blob down of ink, and uh, it doesn't dry so quickly. So it gives me a chance to kind of spread it out. Now these inks are um, very thick, so um, and they're very very light. And with the end result, you might not be able to see very much of this ink at all. Maybe I've covered it up with other inks. Okay, but what this ink does is uh, it kind of coats the paper somewhat and uh, kind of lubricates it so that if you use some other inks, like the Marvy ones, which are thinner and more absorbent, you've kind of put a foundation of this uh, thicker ink down, and it's kind of slippery, okay? It's not, you know, all wet to the touch or anything like that, but it's just kind of giving uh, a nice surface um, moisture to the... Uh, the cardstock, and it will make those other inks that you put on top of it be, you know, if they're thicker or thin, kind of an easier, um, I don't know what you would say, uh, it's an easier um, surface to uh, spread on, okay? Uh, what I mean by that is if you're using something like the Marvy inks, which you can do if you have them, you know, if you lay them down first, you just have to be a little bit more careful because they absorb into the paper quickly. So you have to use a little bit of a different touch, okay, because if I use that first and I just lay down a streak like that, that streak might be set hard and fast because the moisture of it absorbed, you know, past the uh, surface of the paper very quickly. So this is kind of, you know, acting like a, a bit of a, a seal. Um, that makes um, these Marvy inks a little bit um, easier to handle in terms of this uh, type of layering process of uh, dye base things on glossy cardstock. Okay, um, what I've done here is I've almost covered the whole thing. I've left a little bit of uh, lighter areas in here. Okay, even this ink at the uh, the fullest saturation over here, it's pretty wet on the edges where I've started off the application with each re-inking process, you know, tapping. And I've straked it in, usually when this is loaded up with ink, I start on the outside and work in. So the interior probably has um, some of the uh, areas of the page which are have not been touched yet by the ink. All right. So it's kind of establishing somewhat of a, a lighting scheme in here, you know. In here I don't have like a formal specific object like a moon or a sun or something like that, you know, that says, okay, there's my light source, okay. When you just have just, you know, the landscape takes a, um, the majority of the card or scene, um, the lighting, might, as far as lighting scheme, might just be areas that you've left untouched by the ink, okay? So they end up being kind of spotlights, you know, it's like a set of a play or something like that, you know, whatever areas you've left illuminated, you know, which areas you've left dry, will kind of be the areas that you're directing your viewer's eye to, okay? It's just like a, having a spotlight on something. Okay, so this is going on with the pale orange now, and I'm going to 
generally be adding this in the same areas that I did with the previous color. In this case, it was the first color. Okay, I'm adding it a lot on the perimeter. This is almost, uh, it's almost too slippery because what, what ha what's happening is it's like, add some of this down. If I tap it in the corner, um, I can see it a little bit more, you know, more than if I kind of swipe because when I'm swiping it, it's kind of picking up that color and moving it. It's like, uh, you know, absorbing it off the cardstock altogether. So, I mean, I could let this set up a little bit and dry, but uh, I'm not going to do that because I'd have to do that in between every color or I'd have to heat set or something like that. And that's not something that I really need to do. So, um, but that's what you kind of want. You want um, the process, you, you, you want this um, color to, to be applied um, somewhat in a, you know, a gradual um, process. Um, it's not like, uh, you know, calligraphy or something like that, you know, with paint brushes where it's, you know, you touch the, the page and it's set, you know, in terms of a spontaneous mark. When you, if, when you work in this manner, um, of these layers of ink being applied, um, it happens in a very gradual fashion, meaning which also means that you have a lot more control over it, okay? One of these trees here in the foreground is very, very light, and that could, I don't know, that could become somewhat of a uh, problem um, in terms of being able to see it after all these inks have been laid down, but um, it's not really something that bothers me. It's, it's not something that I would, you know, toss out the composition for. Because I just know that if I add darker things in the foreground, like some taller grass, which I plan to do, it's not really going to be that big of a deal. If it was the only thing in my card and I wasn't laying down all these inks over the top of it, you know, I had a tree or something like that and it said something like happy birthday or something like that over there, then that would really kind of stand out because you would be missing a lot of, you know, a focal point image, but this isn't going to be something where it's much of a focal point, at, you know, at all for me. It's very much of a secondary um, element. I guess, I don't know, right now I, there really isn't a focal point, but I'll add something in here you know, later on in the, uh, in the process. Okay, this is adding, I'm adding a lot of uh, this um, pale orange right now. And um, with the first couple colors, um, the first couple colors really establish things as far as a, a lighting scheme of a scene. That's why I'm spending more time with this, because uh, I want to really develop what's going to uh, be happening um, on this scene um, from a lighting scheme. So don't worry, I mean, every color that you use is not going to take this long. The darker you get, the less tone you put down, I'm not, you know, unless you're doing something like a nighttime scene. So I'm not really uh, worried about that. Uh, not that I'm ever concerned about it, but, uh, you know, some people think, um, you know, after it like this. And this is, again, it's a half page scene, so it's fairly large, but um, the, these scenes really don't take too long as far as the process goes. I'm looking at this desert sand. This is the brown right here. I'm thinking about going maybe... Let's try this desert. I don't even know if this desert sand is going to show up at all. I'm using the same tip, by the way, from when I transitioned from one um, 
color or value to the next. Um, that shows up a little bit. It's a little bit more... I don't know what color that is. Of course, the one that I'm using has ink from the previous two colors in there as well, so it's somewhat of a hybrid. But it looks to be more of a, a brownish tone. Not quite as warm. Slightly more, slightly more neutral brown. Browns are warm, but uh, this one's a little bit more of a neutral brown. It's not, it's not so warm. But when I layer it over the top of um, these other inks, it looks a little bit warmer than it is straight out of the pad because these are transparent colors, which dye-based inks are. And you can see the other colors underneath it kind of showing through. Okay. What I need to... Uh, the big thing about the atmosphere in this scene is I want it to look very still and quiet. It's like so much moisture in the air that I don't know, everything kind of becomes muffled, you know, so it's really nice when you hear, like, sounds of nature out there and kind of that, um, that, uh, condition. Everything kind of becomes a little bit softer, all the visuals and all the sounds, birds, whatever, even your own voice sounds uh, kind of a little bit different. Okay, this is the brown, Marvy Brown. It's a uh, number six. Marvy pads, as far as the incarnation of the Marvy matchable with the um, indexed, meaning colored, case is a thing of the past. They're not making those anymore, but the the Marvy reinkers are out there. And the convenience of the pad is nice, um, but you know, if you have a, uh, a little ink um, tray or whatnot, you can always put a few drops of ink, like if a Marvy ink or something like that. It could be another brand too, but you can easily use these uh, colors with just, you know, a sponge, uh, a sponging tool with those reinkers. Okay, so you don't really need a pad for that. Um, that being said, they do sell um, blank pads that you can ink up yourself. A lot of inks have the same viscosity, so you can probably mix and match your cases if you have blank cases. Um, but the Marvies are a little bit thicker, I mean a thinner ink, so um, the pad material is a little bit different. It's a little bit thicker so that, um, you know, in terms of a, a raised pad, it won't, um, the ink won't, you know, end up pouring out the side, so. If you have Marvy inks, in other words, I, I probably wouldn't use a different uh, bl uh, pe blank pad. I'd probably go with the Marvy one, but I don't know. I'm sure some work. Um, mixing and matching cases. But like I said, Marvy's just about the thinnest of all the inks, as far as I know. Not in terms of richness, you know, being diluted or anything like that, but just the viscosity of it. The colors are very saturated and bright. Okay, now this is kind of a medium toned brown, right? This is what it would look like on a piece of paper, but, you know, I put it next to this and it's this one's quite a bit lighter, isn't it? And that's because um, when I lay you know, some of it down, I'm spreading it out so it's not a full 
kind of swatch, you know, of that tone. It's kind of more of a, uh, a thin layer of it. Dry, uh, it's like a drier streak. Okay, so we can really kind of, kind of start seeing, you know, the lighting scheme developing here. Right? I generally like to frame off my edges of the card, four corners especially, to contain the composition, so I'll add more of this in these two areas. It's really not very dark yet, is it? Okay. Um, brown tones. Um, I could go with this dark brown at this point in time, but I think I'm going to give the those darker tones uh, a rest for right now. And I think I'm, I want to kind of expand um, the temperature range of this scene at this time. And I, I think I want to try um, some of these uh, kind of more violet purple tones just to see what they're going to look like. Like I said, these colors harmonize with each other fairly well, um, so I don't really need to uh, worry about it. I'm just going to go with this straight on top of the brown tone. And this one is a orchid. It's the number 78. Marby, if you don't have something like orchid, you know, if you have um, any colors like pink in your dye-based repertoire, you know, something like one of these would work just fine. I don't know if I would go with something so hot in terms of a pink right now, but if that's all you had, one of the things you can do is you put a little bit of water, you can ink up your sponge and then put a little water in it and that'll dilute it so that the intensity of a super hot pink won't be quite as intense because it will be watered down a little bit. Okay, just laying it down. Pull this up here so you can kind of see it. See that tone right there? It's different than this area out here, right? You can kind of see what it's going to look like. I think that's, I don't know, could be a little bit more rich than over here, just by adding that in. I don't know if I want to add it everywhere. I know I might end up doing that, but um, I'll see. You know, I'll just kind of start adding it in. And one of the things that you might notice is I'm kind of working an area. When I switch off to a new color, I'm not just going this, like this type of perimeter application, you know, like that. I'm usually working one small area at a time, okay? If I were to play this back and analyze it, I'd probably do like, I don't know, three quadrants, you know, or right here, one, two, three. Um, the side I go one, two, three. And the colors in the middle, I mean, I do go in there a little bit more, but mostly most of the times it's kind of like when I'm streaking from the edge in. So you can think about this in terms of maybe three areas that I'm working on, and I don't work on two really at the same time. And there's kind of a reason for that. It's because if I want this nice transition going from wet to dry, dark to light, I have to work this tool where it's wet, and then as that ink comes off of it, it's not laying down quite as much ink, right? So it's more of a dry brush type of effect. Wet to dry, dark to light, okay? That's how you get these nice transitions. It's when people go like this, you know, that they start getting these shapes everywhere because it's an isolated tapping of it, all right? So I'm really condensing that tapping in a certain area and I'm working it from the outside 
the perimeter of the card to the interior like this, okay? You can use both tapping and streaking. And I, li I like the uh, I like the uh, these this combination so far, where some of it has been added to the white area. I can see more of a pure orchid, where it's overlapping the um, brown tones. It's just coming becoming more of a kind of a warmer. Um, reddish haze, it's, I mean, it's not so red, but in Orchid there's more of, you know, more of that red tone, reddish color that's been mixed in without so much of the yellow. Um, the thing that, that I'm thinking of in terms of um, the look, you know, I, I wasn't going for so much of a, like a warm sunset or something like that in this scene. So what I'm going for is more of a muted warmth. And like I said, I don't know if I'm going to achieve it or not, but, uh, but that's kind of the idea. I mean, it could change. You know, I might get, you know, to a certain point and think, all right, I, I don't like this. I, it just needs something, you know, like a vibrancy or something like that. Then if I want to, I can just go over the whole thing with yellow, you know, and just dab that in it. It'll brighten up, you know. It'll warm up everything, you know, in terms of uh, kind of the intensity of the temperature. Um, I don't foresee having to do that, though. But uh, but I could. You know, sometimes that happens. Sometimes I, ha I go back with a, you know, a really super light tone over the top of something um, just because the end result, by the time I got to the darker tones, working through whatever color scheme I'm working in, it just, I look at it and it just seems boring to me, you know. So, you can work in addition, in addition to light to dark, you can always go back and add in more of a certain tone that you went through or a completely different one. On this one, I don't think I would use, you know, something like a, I don't know, green or something. I mean, you could, you could put little elements of there or something like that. But what I'm saying is, you can't really turn this color scheme now into a completely vibrant, you know, green patch of grass. I don't, I don't think, you know. I could turn it greenish, but you'll have all these kind of those purple tones kind of showing through um, the colors that you lay down on top. So, you know, it's not going to look like that color green, you know, if I put it on top of all these other tones, in other words. Okay, I think that <laughs> I said you don't have to spend so much, you know, time with, uh, you know, any given color, you know, usually by the time you get past the first few, but I, I have been spending a lot of time with this, um, this orchid. I, I, I kind of like what's happening in here. It's kind of giving me more of that feel. Um, it doesn't look like the scene that, you know, that I'm kind of had in my head in terms of a, you know, kind of a reference. But, you know, at this point in time, I'm kind of going for more of the feel of it. I want to mute down some of the, uh, some of those lighter areas in there. I, I don't want to be so stark white, you know, in terms of the page. Okay, so that is Orchid. Let's try um, Deep Lilac. It's really not quite so deep, uh, in my opinion. It's it's a fairly light tech. Now, this Orchid, I had a feeling, was a little bit darker in terms of value, 
than this uh, deep blue I like, so I am taking off some of the ink before I ink up um, this next tone. I would say the value looks about the same. This is kind of a grayer violet than the lilac. So it can, can be more of a kind of a muted um, violet, um, which, like I said, kind of for this scene is a good thing to have. I want it kind of soft in here. Sometimes laying that um, a warm tone under cool tones um, is a good way to work because the cool tones will have kind of a, a little bit of a glow, okay? Because it's uh, showing through the uh, that cooler dark tone. Or cooler, uh, uh, cooler tone, I guess. This isn't quite so dark yet. There's something kind of interesting that I'm watching here. Um, I mean, this page, I've added a lot of tone down, but I'm getting a little bit of texturing, and I think it has to do with them um, kind of having that thicker layer on the bottom so that the colors that I'm laying down on the top are kind of spreading a little bit, giving it this kind of well, text. Let me see if I can show you. So a little kind of texturing right there where it's um, a little bit darker and lighter. It's like inks are kind of beating a little bit, all right? Um, which isn't bad. I guess, I don't know, I, maybe I added more of that, uh, more of the lighter tones than I thought I did. It's just kind of giving uh, the scene a little bit more texture. All right, that's good for the deep Lilac. That's the number 61 in the Marvy uh, numbering convention. Sweet Plum. Um, at this point in time, I'm wondering if I really want that. One of the things I always say to my, uh, when I used to teach to my students is um, if they're thinking about trying a different color. Now, if they told me they wanted this grass to be all green at this point in time, I would probably, you know, steer them away from that, but when it comes to kind of color of uncertainty within, you know, a certain swatch or color scheme, I usually just tell them, try it out, you know, in a little corner. You don't have to make a full commitment to, um, you know, a given color or value. You can always just add it in a little corner, and then if you like it, you can always add more, okay? So it's not like just, you know, closing my eyes and just tapping this all over the place. Um, it's just one value darker, and it's, in this case, there's a little bit more of a, you know, a reddish uh, tinge to this uh, particular color um, than some of the other ones that I've used so far. And I thought that looked pretty good. Okay, so let me add a little bit more. Everything's looking a little bit more muted, I think, and soft. Going through my mind right now, I'm thinking, um, what other color can I use in here? Now, I haven't used the dark brown yet, so maybe that's the color, but I eventually want to get to black, and the reason why that is, is because the darkest color that I used in here so far has been black in the trees, okay? Now I've laid down a lot of color down here, and if I lay black on top of that, it's not going to be applying kind of in a thick um, 
application, you know, a thick impression, you know, when I wipe it on. So it'll be a grayer tone, but having kind of um, the finishing tone on the perimeter of the darkest color that you used on an image will tie things together a little bit more. I mean, this is still really busy in here, so when you when I lay the black down on here eventually, um, things will kind of blend in with one another a little bit more, and you're bringing the dark ground back uh, darker. So um, things in the foreground or whatever those darkest elements are within a scene will kind of blend in with each other a little bit more. So um, uh, there won't be so much contrast between the darkest images and whatever's behind them. So what you're doing is you're cutting down the contrast so something doesn't stand out quite as much, right? I mean, cutting down the contrast completely would be just to darken the whole scene, right, and make it black. So there, there's no contrast. Well, we, we don't want to do that, but, uh, but just to make a point as far as um, kind of the, uh, the nature of the scene in terms of uh, how busy it looks uh, can be changed with the use of background value, okay? These, these branches really stand out right now because they're in black at 100% and the background is probably more of like a 60%, so we have 100% next to a 60%, but if I take that background on the edges and I make it like an 80% value or something like that, or 90 even, between 190 or totally talking, uh, you know, a very small... Um, range in terms of value, so uh, they'll blend in better. And by having those darker uh, perimeter tones, um, it really frames off the scene nicely. that um, purplish tinge to it. All right, um, let's see. I need to get into this grassy area. It's too much dark and light, like a little oval in here, so I want to break this up a little bit um, with some texture. Okay, so let's go Somewhere like this. Working from the outside in again. So see that variation is what um, adds to the uh, visual um, kind of richness of a scene. All right, so we have that right now. Let's do some more of that. Let's take it from the other side. You've probably seen this rip paper towel done in clouds more than a than other parts of a scene, but um, it works great in the grass or uh, even in water. Um, I usually do streaks in water, but you can kind of do that paper towel technique in there too. Okay, let's see. Let's do another one. A little bit more variation. I probably 
wouldn't use kind of the straight edge of a you know paper towel that you've taken off the rack like I think this would be too straight right here so when you rip it you know like that that torn edge will give you a little bit more variation and I think that looks better in these areas all right let's see let's get this hill in the back of the hill there's kind of no um, kind of separation between the uh, the land and sky which which is fine um, but maybe on the edges at least I'll create a stronger separation by defining the top of that uh, background hill okay something like that it's coming in from right here right see that over here it's the difference between over here and over here um, I think it creates more depth in the scene but maybe in the middle I leave it alone maybe I do want that uh, you know I want it to have that situation where you can't tell where the uh, land ends and the sky begins and layers of hills in here. Let's let's go and create a separation between uh, another layer of uh, imagery. And I'll show you what I mean um, here in a minute. Okay. So, by putting down some of these things in the foreground just kind of break up the uh, the monotony of a, a big open lit area but where I've laid down um, some inks right right here it's saying that there's another kind of slope that you know dips down behind here uh, and this area in the background is the I guess it'd probably be like one two three um, hills in terms of uh, creating depth okay And let's bring this shadow right here that's defining that little hill over into this area. So one more area. Okay. Kind of a land is kind of coming together a little bit. Okay. I think we're ready for black. All right. All right, this one was my kind of drier black pad that I started off with um, in the scene and I think I want that kind of drier one to start off with it's just easier to apply the um, the perimeter of the card is starting to set up a little bit more so um, remember like these Marvy inks are a little bit thinner so at this point in time well you know especially at this point in time. I don't want to have that type of mark, you know, big oval shape, okay? Darker tones, one of the things you do is you use a little bit of a lighter touch depending on how wet your pads are. If you're using a really wet pad, it's going to leave a much stronger impression like that, okay? So, I don't want that, so when I ink up, it's just a very light tap like that, okay? So, it doesn't have to be a precarious um, process, you know, in terms of uh, getting unwanted marks. Now, notice I'm staying in this area, this quadrant, or what do you might say? Uh, yeah, 
I guess quadrant. I'm really utilizing the um, the dry um, tip here to achieve kind of a nice transition of, uh, of values. Okay, so keep tapping. When it's at its wettest, start again, start off in the corners or the edge where there's a lot of ink already laid down. Okay, so here's the difference between the sides here. This side has black and this side doesn't, okay? I think I, I'm going to bring that in even more over here, but you can kind of see where it's kind of muting the, uh, the imagery in terms of the clarity of it. Um, you know, being against a lighter background. Now it's I'm putting it against a darker background, especially up here. It's really starting to kind of, you know, obscure that image. It's kind of, you know, blending in with the sides, right? Let's do it on the other side. Um, the thing that's going through my head right now is I'm wondering if I want to lay down um, some additional tone in here. Like possibly a darker purple and violet or something else. Um, I'm also wondering if I didn't, maybe if I did, I left this area in here a little bit too light. It's right now this area in here is kind of looking like a light source and um, I want things to be a little bit more muted, so I might bring in some of my lighter tones and fill in that area. If I'm going to do that, I have to ask myself, do I want to do it in the same, you know, hue that I use, like for example, the Peach Bellini, or do I want to use a different tone? I could use a blue in there or something like that, and it'll look blue because it's kind of going over, you know, some bare, just white cardstock still. Or if I want the purity of color, tone, of a, a different hue, I guess it could be like an accent hue, like I said, like a blue or something, I can, I can add that in there. Uh, there isn't like a, a right and wrong. I mean, one thing might look one way and another thing could look a completely different way and they both might look nice. Um, one might have a different, you know, have one might have the scene kind of take on a different character. But there's, there's more than one solution to just, you know, anything in terms of scenic stamping. So you might realize, especially if you're watching any of the videos on my channel, um, the process is, is fairly gradual, especially in this technique right here. I can do scenes that, you know, take five minutes as well. Um, but this one, like I said, this scene right here is um, one that I've been thinking about for a long time, and it's it's about the uh, it's about the feel of that 
moment that I'm, yeah, I was going to say kind of trying to replicate, but I don't know, capture, um, reference. So I'm kind of still hunting for that feeling here. As opposed to just stamping out a scene without really yeah, having anything in mind and saying, okay, that looks fine. Okay. That's the black, all right? Things are a little bit more muted in terms of the imagery, especially with all those spiny branches in there. But yeah, um, let's see here. Let's see what color I can use just to kind of knock it down a little bit more and mute it. Um, if I go with something out of the same color scheme, that would be fine. But I might want just some kind of slight variation in there. Just in terms of adding to the visual um, richness of a scene. I can do something like this. I know that looks weird, but just having a touch of it down here might be kind of interesting in the foreground. I still want something up in that sky, just to kind of knock it down a little bit. I think up there I'm going to stick to kind of something blending in easy, which would just be the same color that I've used before. This is the peach bellini. Let's let's go in and just fill in that area a little bit more. Okay. That was the peach bellini. Let's try the desert sand. Desert Sand Memento. All right. All right, now everything going on right now in here is, it's that monochromatic look, right, that we're kind of thinking about. I think this, just in terms of uh, visual interest, I think it wouldn't be bad to play around with this light area, okay? Let's try some of this um, color. It might be a little bit too hot in terms of, uh, let me get this, uh, I need to get this black out of this uh, tip. Okay, this looks really black here, but there's nothing on it. It's just stained a little bit from years of use. Um, let's take a look at this color. Okay, that's pretty bright right here. By the way, this is a yellow-green. But I don't have to, like, again, I don't have to use that uh, intensity of it. I can use that one, you know, which is very light, right? I don't know if you can even see it, right? So that's a lot different than that. So that's what I want to use when I start applying it on here. Okay, it just happens very gradually. It's kind of adding a little bit of a temperature change in that area. It's a little bit of an intensity change in terms of brightness. Mostly Mostly temperature though, and hue. I get well hue for sure. Okay, so to see that little bit of green down there, um, I'm not putting it right on the the pink, but I think just that little touch right there. Let's pull it back here. See, I th I just think that looks a little bit more interesting. 
adding that other hue in that area. No wonder nothing was coming off. I was using the wrong tip. Okay. So here's a little bit of green there. Okay. Now if I want to create this kind of passage way up here where the viewer's eye kind of starts here and kind of goes through that opening, I can kind of create a a little bit of a visual path in terms of color, similar colors through this area. All right, so that's where we have it right here. It's green, green, green right here, kind of leading the viewer's eye up through that passageway. It's kind of a visual passage, not in terms of like a formal trail or something like that, or a road. Okay, I've added a little bit down here in this area. Uh, I don't like it quite as much as over here, but it's fine. Okay. Is that how I want it to be? Maybe. I think it could use a little bit more um, black on the perimeter. While I did that green, maybe this area on the perimeter has had a chance to set up a little bit more to accept a thicker application of black. We shall see. concentrate this um, application of it in, in the four corners. And maybe I'll come in a little bit more up here in the sky just to kind of close it off. It, it is still looking fairly light up there. for some foreground imagery. Okay. I mean, it looks okay as is, but adding that last layer into the foreground can really kind of expand um, the depth of field um, within a scene. and uh, kind of strengthen that visual passage that I was talking about. In other words, when I start stamping this out, I'm going to leave some room in the middle here, you know, that allows the viewer's eye to enter. I don't want it to be like a... If you stamp this all the way across the front, it might look a little bit more claustrophobic, like you're penning something in, okay? I want there to be a kind of an opening and an exit. Um, it doesn't have to be for every scene, but I'm just saying for this one right here. When I'm making the impressions of this, I'm kind of holding this down a little bit longer because the page is a little bit wet right now. Especially where there's areas where I just added that um, black uh, perimeter uh, application of ink. perimeter layer of ink. Okay. See the grass down here? I've left a little bit of an opening. I've stamped it over the top of one another. I've kind of changed the angle at times. Like this. 
and like that. Change the height of the, the impression so there's variation to it. Okay. It's really crying out for something in the middle there in terms of a kind of a subject matter, so we'll add something in there. But um, what we'll do is we'll go through some uh, added effects in here, um, specifically uh, some color box pigment ink. We'll see if that how that looks in here. Sometimes I, I didn't leave too much of the white in here at all. Maybe there's a little strip of it in there, so I don't know how that's going to look kind of, uh, you know, throughout the scene in terms of kind of this rolling fog, you know, or moisture coming in, like white out. But uh, we'll test it out. But I don't want to do it yet because, like I said, the perimeter is a little bit wet, you know, and especially these reeds. Um, by the way, those, that was the reed large stamp right down here in the foreground that would just absolutely uh, drag some of that ink and, and smear it if I did it right now, so um, I don't want to go over that area right now, so I'll let this set up a little bit more, and then uh, again, we'll be back to finish the scene off. I'll probably put somebody in as far as the background or up here in the sky, you know, that'll kind of end up being the focal point of the whole scene, especially if it's a living um, organism. So, all right, let this set up. Okay, I'm back, and it's been uh, longer than a couple hours. I'm here the next day. And I took a look at this scene, and uh, sometimes, I don't know, stepping away from it for a little bit and coming back and looking at it with uh, fresh eyes um, kind of reveals some things, and um, I think the scene definitely needs something. It's kind of boring, you know, there's, there's a kind of a monotony, I guess, from, uh, you know, over the entire scene, it's it's just too. Um, I don't know. There's 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 not much going on in it right now. It's in terms of uh, uh, variation, it's just too too much similarity from one side of the scene to the next. In in terms of color, texture, pattern, everything, and I I think what it needs is it, it needs a little. I don't know, zap of color in some areas. So I've pulled out some additional stamps here. Um, these are the spiny branch stamps. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to use everything, but um, I want to add a few little elements in here. Um, nothing too extreme in terms of uh, the brightness of color, but I thought some green would look good in here. This is a very dark green. I don't know if it looks like a it might look like a black. Let me see if I can get it to focus in here. But this color right here, it's called Bottle Green. And um, it's one of the darkest greens that um, I've seen out there in terms of what's offered uh, from some different uh, um, pad manufacturers. Let me see if I can find. Here's another Bottle Green. I have two of them. One of them might be dry. I haven't used it for a while. Here we go. This one's a pine green, this one's just called regular green, and this is a bottle green. Usually people have a neutral green in their stamp, uh, I don't know, pad selection. Usually something like a neutral green is something akin to like a Christmas green or something like that. So we'll see what uh, those read like over the top of it. Um, I'm not really quite sure what I'm going to stamp in here, but um, see this one right here is called Rocks and Leaves, and what I might want to do is use the uh, the leaf portion, maybe some of the rocks down here, I'm not sure, but I, I think some of these leaves would be good in um, kind of a brighter green. Uh, I guess that's what, one of the things that's going on in here. There's no... Um, there's, no there's a lack of intensity Okay. In terms of brightness. Now when I say brightness, it's it's the uh 
it's the intensity of it, not the lightness, okay? So I need some more intense um, colors in here somewhere. So let's just try this and see what it looks like. Um, let me see this bottle green. Okay, I haven't used this for a while. I'm, I don't think, well, okay, I thought it was dry, but it looks like we're okay. Let's see, where should I put this? Maybe I'll put some, a cluster of it down here. I'm, th I'm thinking mostly about foreground right now. I might add some other things in the background, but um, let's add some of this in the foreground areas. Okay. And again, this is the number 25 bottle green. It's, it's a fairly dark green. If you don't have, you know, if only you have it, if you only have like a light green or a medium green, um, you can always add some uh, black or something like that to your stamp. You can color it directly or you can put, um, you know, ink it up with green and then put a couple dabs of uh, black into it and you'll get a achieve a, a different, uh, a darker value of uh, any given color. I wouldn't go from, you know, black and then add green to it otherwise you can infect your lighter pad with a darker color but you can always go from a lighter color into a darker one and it should be fine um okay now that looks okay to me it looks it stands out quite a bit to me right now um but the ink is really wet right now so it's going to dry to a a lighter value um, when it does that. And then in the end, if you've seen my video on uh, spraying your scene, um, everything will get darker um, when uh, the, uh, the saturation is kind of brought back uh, with the use of a spray sealant. All right, so that looks okay to me. It looks kind of strange because it's just kind of sitting out there on its own. It's the only thing uh, of that intensity in there right now, but I think we'll add some more. Um, let's go about right here. Okay. What I'm going to end up doing is I'm, as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, I'm kind of referencing um, somewhat of a memory of a a moment of nature that I saw and it was kind of a transition from um, kind of sunset to twilight that happened and <laughs> with the colors in here that I'm adding uh, I'm probably bringing it much closer to uh, sunset than, uh, than twilight. I was kind of thinking more of the twilight um, scene that I uh, witnessed, but now I've kind of brought it back a little bit, you know, being that colors are going to be a little bit more distinct. Okay, so we have just some texturing going on in here um, with the use of these leaves. Let's bring some over here as well. Kind of some more, some brighter earth tones, you know? I guess you can say this, you know, what I'm going after in this. Okay, so we have some green in there. It's kind of hard to um, imagine what, how that's going to look when that dries, but um, we shall see when that time comes. But already the, the texture looks a little bit, um, the surface texture is a little bit more richer to me, um, just in terms of these shapes in here. That uh, sedge filler had a certain monotony to it. 
um, which it's kind of intended to do. It's just a filler stamp. It's not supposed to be like the, uh, not supposed to kind of st you know stand out. You want it to blend as much as possible, which it ends up doing. But um, just too much of that um, can be uh, not quite as uh, exciting as you would like, um, just on its own. But that's why I'm kind of filling in here. All right, let's see these spiny branches. Let's see what uh, let's see what I can what the seam can take. I'm trying to think of uh, where it might be used. Okay, I think it can take some uh, some shapes down in this area. I I'm not going to stamp the whole thing out. Like this would be too much. But again, I'm just going to have it jutting out of the uh, the grassy area and in, in in spots. And, okay, uh, instead of doing it in black, which I could do, and I could kind of spot color it, I can color it all in black and take a, like a brush marker and uh, take off some of that black ink with the brush marker and add in some other tone, maybe some brown or... I'm saying if I had some kind of rusty color. Um, let me see here. And here's a bit of a, I don't know what color this is. This is an 85 Margit. A lot of my pens might be dry. Eh, that one's not too bad. Um, this is a dark brown. It's the uh, same version of brown that comes in the pad. That's why they call these matchables, because they match their pens. Okay, that's a dark brown. I was thinking kind of a reddish tone would be kind of nice, too. Let me try something here. Um, all right. acrylic block. That should do it right there. It'll hang off the bottom a little bit, but I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to color the bottom of it anyway, so I'll go with something like that. do this. Um, I was thinking about that sweet plum, which is the color that I layered into the scene. Um, I want something a little bit more rusty, though. This is an English red. Let's see if this is a. It might be a little bit too red. But, alright, let's give this a shot here. Alright, that was the English red. Alright, now let's go in and add some additional color with this dark brown. Actually, I'm going for more of the dark brown than the red, okay? But I want kind of a, so it'll be a kind of a fusion of both of them. Maybe I'll have to use a little bit of black, too. stamping of that. <laughs> I'm not even quite sure what color I'm gonna get. Let's add some black to the tips here, these uh, these branches. Okay, this is just using the black Marvy. You can use a black whatever. Maybe not stays on or something, but uh, any dye-based ink, something that's not gonna dry so fast. Alright, that's a lot of color in there for one impression, but um, why not?
Okay, let's see what we have here. Let's have this branch kind of sticking out of the, uh, the grass. We'll go in the foreground. By putting down that ripped paper towel mask, it'll, you know, look like it's sticking out of the grass in some areas, and some areas a little bit more than others in the space that I'm stamping it in, kind of holding it down a little bit longer because uh, I want a lot of that ink to transfer. Okay, yeah, it looks okay right here. It really stands out again, but it'll kind of blend in with the background. But I need another... Actually, actually I kind of like that. It looks like the... Uh, this manzanita um, bush that um, kind of we see in the mountains around here. Uh, around here, meaning uh, California. Let's go for that again. Okay. Let's see if I can remember the combination. It goes English red, which is kind of a rusty red, um, dark brown, well I'll use a little bit more dark brown on this um, than the previous one because this is smaller so I need it to be a little bit more, a little bolder I guess. Okay, and let's go for the black in here as well. There was more of the red that came out, um, that English red on that first impression than I, than I thought uh, would come out. All right, let's, let's put some in this area in here. This area in here, this passageway was really quite uh, boring to me. something else here at the side. Okay, I just I just tapped that. Uh, <laughs> I was gonna go into that English red, but all right. I just said don't do that. I mean sometimes I might do that. It depends if the uh if the lighter pad is really juicy and the darker one isn't quite so much you won't have so much of a transference of that darker ink into the the lighter ink, you know, because it's just not going to be that absorbent. Uh, okay, let's go with one over here. And I apologize for the length of this video. Um, if you happen to make it this far. All right, another impression kind of out here. It's a little bit more obscure. I just blurred some of that uh, impression of the uh, those uh, leaves, those green leaves. Uh, but they're kind of in the darkness over there anyway, so not too big of a deal, um, to me at least. All right, how about right in here? You know, it's kind of funny. I, you spend all this time stamping on a scene, doing whatever, little elements here and there, um, large elements, big application of, of applications of color, whatnot. 
but sometimes, I don't know, you add in these other little elements somewhere along the line, and for me, a lot of times that's where the scene just starts to come together. Um, I mean, it looked, it was okay before, but it, it really felt incomplete um, from a visual standpoint to me. For me, um, looking at this now, I, I don't know, I, I, I think there's a lot of improvement um, just with this one branch here, this spiny branch one. It's just changing the texture. It needed something a little bit more of a bold application. I, I guess the scene looked kind of... Uh, unresolved or... Uh, kind of lacking a certain uh, decisiveness. All right. All right. Now, what this is doing to the if we were to break this up, one, two, three different um, um, sections. Okay, the bottom section, the mid section, the top section. There was a certain monotony going on in those three sections, but now we've really changed uh, this bottom one up uh, quite a bit from the uh, this other two sections, so the bottom third now has its own character, I would say, um, from the mid and top one. Um, let me see here. I just realized there's a big <laughs> thing of light here. I'm going to have to go close that shade. There's a bunch of light coming in from the, uh, this window, but um, let me see here. All right, that's what the scene looks like right now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in some little elements down here on these branches. I think like some little red pops of red with the uh, um, red uh, alcohol-based pen, and we'll put those down there on those. Like, or maybe I can put a few little leaves um, onto these uh, some of these branches, like it's just. Uh, um, getting some foliage uh, with some green or whatnot, or I can do it in yellow too, like it's like it's fall or something like that. And the uh, the leaves are turning. Um, and I'm trying to think of what I want to do here in the background, but we'll figure this out. Anyways, I blurred all of that green over there because I had such a strong saturation of it again, so. Um, I will wait for this to dry a little bit, and we'll come back to it and we'll see if there's anything else that's kind of revealed in terms of uh, what it needs. Okay. Okay, we're back yet again, and uh, taking a look at the scene, and uh, the green ink from the leaves has dried, and um, I'm thinking the the intensity of them is a little bit um, it's a little bit brighter um, dried than I would have thought um, they would be so I'm going to add yet another layer in here uh, just of that same um, spiny branch stamp and um, I'm going to knock them back a little bit so uh, what I mean by that is this um, these leaves right here kind of stand out a little bit to me, or a lot, because of the intensity of them, the brightness of the green. So a way to uh, kind of um, subdue that a little bit visually is to just not have that green um, Quite as I'm trying to move this up here, just so I don't start uh, stamping off the page or out of the uh, the field of view here. Um, that's the closest thing to my eye uh, in that area. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to layer it with something else. And the easiest thing to do is 
pages is put something in front of it. Not to completely um, cover up, but just to push it back a little bit. So what I'm doing is I'm inking this up with um, black, but I'm also putting a little bit of this dark brown into it. Okay, and what we'll do is we'll just mask off some of this. It looks like that's the same area, but I'll just go down a little bit from that previous masking there, and we'll just put some more branches in here. All right, let's see, let's see right there. A little branches in there, a little bit of uh, texture and shape to uh, cover that up a little bit. And uh, let's see, looking elsewhere in the scene. If, while I have this out, I might as well uh, add more if I'm going to do that. Um, let's see, this is a I think what color I would do that in. Let's use some of this dark brown again. Okay. The scene, the scene gets more and more uh, complex. The more I get into it here. It really wasn't meant to uh, take this long as far as the compositional elements went, but um, when you get into a scene, and as long as I feel like, as long as I've been working on it for this long, I might as well just take it, you know, as far as it seems to want to go. Okay. I'm trying to think if I want some more that I'm starting to like this um, element in there more than I thought I would. I thought I would like it, but I like it even more than I thought. So it's just, it's making the area down here a little bit more visually interesting to me. Um, it's probably more akin to kind of that scene that I saw as well, the area there. I mean, it wasn't just a bunch of grass, it was, you know, there was a lot of bushes and it was really full um, with a lot of dead branches. Maybe these, you know, this manzanita looking branch here could be, uh, you know, the uh, burnt remnants of, uh, you know, that previous fire, so. Not only, were, not only were trees kind of in there, but there were, you know, kind of bushes interspersed in there, you know, that would have been kind of large enough to uh, remain after the fire. Okay. Yeah, that looks better. So, what we have now is a real change of, uh, kind of textures, you know, on this lower third, you know, from the middle and top. And <laughs> I'm really trying to uh, prevent myself from um, stamping some of that in that middle section right there. Otherwise, then we'll, we're going to be right back to where we started from, you know, as far as um, kind of changing um, the texture from one area to the next, you know, and having such a kind of a monotonous pattern going. Um, so we have this down here. Now, what these branches also did in terms of, um, you know, having a different texture, I think what it's kind of opened up the possibility of is just adding some other types of colors down here. Like I said, I, I might, you know, put a little bit of, um, 
let's say this was some kind of dormant um, branch or whatever bush, um, I could put on some uh, little detailed elements with some maybe like uh, leaves popping out in some of these branches somewhere. And that'll be a really nice little element down here. And it's that type of detail, I think, that really um, can... Uh, it's, it's like um, it can retain the, um, the attention of the viewer, you know? What you get is the overall, you know, impact from looking at a scene from whatever distance you would look at it at, you know, two feet or something like that. But then upon further inspection, you know, there might be other little things to um, retain that viewer's attention. We used to do that in illustration. We talked about the difference between like a poster and uh, an interior spread. Poster has to capture the viewer's attention from distance, you know, and have impact. But then as you get closer, you want to have other things to um, kind of further inspect, you know, and to keep that viewer's attention. Uh, same thing on interior spreads, too. You look at it for impact, and then you want, you know, if you want to uh, retain that viewer's um, attention, you have to have something more, and having something in the details is the, you know, kind of an easy way to do um, that. And it just makes things a little bit more visually interesting, kind of like having a little tapestry. Okay, let's see here. Let's start adding in some additional details here. Let's see. How about the color here? The color's looking a little bit... Um, I'm trying to think. Here's the thing. When I spray these, um, the intensity and saturation of kind of um, the colors is going to come out again to what it looked like you know, when this scene was wet. But, um, I think I might just add some more color into this. Let's go back to this little peach bellini. Let me just add some of this down really fast. You won't be able to see too much um, in terms of a change here. This was a really light color. But I want to see that intensity again. I'm wondering if I should just kind of balance it off a little bit more. So you can always go back with a lighter tone and um, layer it over the top of it. It'll probably dry dull again though, but um, here's what I'm doing. I'm kind of adding another base layer again. Just not quite as much as I did that first time around, but... Um, I think I might want to just frame this scene just a little bit more. Let's go back to the black. Um, especially in the four corners here. Oops. Let's see, that's bottle green. It's not my black. Okay. Just for lack of a better kind of a term, I call this tipping the edges. It's just getting the uh, four corners a little bit darker. And I think that that vignette, um, that darker vignette around the, the scene, really helps to contain it um, compositionally. See how much darker it is from here to here? And that's because when I added the black in here before, the page was fairly wet, so it wasn't grabbing that ink um, as much as uh, you know I would have liked ideally but that's not to say that it was bad at the time it's just it makes it easier to spread and blend but if you want to make the uh, the saturation of that ink a little bit darker it has to uh, adhere to the page the paper so you might just have to let it dry a little bit. I mean, I could have done this at any time. I could add in some little different effects and do this, you know, after I add in some color box uh, pigment ink, you know, into the scene. 
Um, you can't really add it in after you, if you do, end up spraying your cards. It really won't stick very well. I guess if you use it, if you spray it with a workable fixative, maybe it will, but if it's something like a like a Krylon Crystal Clear or um, like a polyurethane or something like that, it, it's going to seal the surface of the uh, card and uh, like dye-based inks won't stick to it quite as easily. I mean, it might go on a little bit, but it probably just depends on how much um, sealant you uh, you put down. And sealants are... I, I highly recommend that for um, your scenes. It doesn't make things light fast and prevent them from fading. If you're going to put something on display, like in a frame or something like that, or if you send a card to someone, um, and let's say this happens a lot, they put it up, you know, you make a nice scene for someone and uh, if they have it on their refrigerator or something like that, or out, um, if they have it out for months, you know, dye-based inks are really going to be, uh, you know, subject to fading, which is fine, you may not have to make these kind of archival, you know, like it's going to last for 50 years, people should enjoy them, right? But, um, that being said, um, you know, they will fade. There are some um, sprays that are like UV sprays, you know, and that might um, retain the uh, the intensity a little bit longer, but, um, you know, dive stinks are pretty... Um, they're not real light fast, so they probably will fade a little bit. These memento inks um, are supposed to be uh, fade resistant. But, um, I don't know, I haven't really done any kinds of tests on them, but, um, but I, do, I do know what I've seen um, from other types of inks, and that would be all dye-based inks, you know, not just the ones in the crafting world that would go for oil paints and, you know, um, acrylics, you know, they have this light fastness rating on the back, and it's typically look brighter, the, uh, um, color, um, the more prone they, they are to, uh, to fading, like a hot pink or something like that fades really fast. Okay, we have this nice vignette going. I think it's contained the image, uh, the composition a little bit more. And these trees off to the side, I like how they're kind of blending into the background a little bit more, and the more you get into the scene, um, towards the middle of the scene, um, they're a lot more distinct because the contrast between it and the background is um, wider. Okay, that looks okay. Let me let's see. Let's add in. Let me get another paper towel. So after you start using these like this, and it starts developing a lot of ink on the uh, the paper towel, it sometimes it starts to soak through in the back. And if you keep using the same thing, what happens is it starts soaking through, and you get this kind of that patterning of the uh, the paper towel um, kind of showing through. And this is just using that black. Let's give it a little bit more range. Why don't we add some uh, shading around where these uh, branches are coming out of the uh, out of that grassy area. Kind of anchors them down a little bit more. I mean, this isn't something that I have to do, but um, it can be one of those little things, one of those little extra accents. Okay. You see, like, kind of right at the base of some of these things, I'm adding some shadows. Okay. It provides a nice little kind of foundation. A 
if anyone ever watches these videos in sequence, um, after a scene like this, typically it's a, like a half page scene or a larger scene. Uh, the next two or three videos after that, um, the scenes typically are a lot faster. I'll do a scene that takes, you know, maybe a couple hours or whatever. And then the next two scenes might be a, you know, like a 20 minute variety. But every now and then I like to do these uh, scenes that little, you know, I can kind of invest more time into. Uh, in this case, it was, this was a scene that I've been thinking about for a long time. And I, I think, you know, this, it's kind of coming out not as um, kind of I thought it would. I didn't really have a fixed, you know, thing in mind, but um, as far as like the coloring, I guess, and the mood, it's, it's really changed uh, and it's gone in its own direction. So I still want to do this other one, um, kind of more akin to uh, this photo I took um, that day. And I was thinking about, I'll probably use some violets or something. But like I said, sometimes you just kind of have to you just have to kind of go in the direction that, you know, the scene wants to go. So it's more of a reference than replication, uh, you know, for sure. All right, that looks better, I think. Okay, down below. Right now it's kind of really become kind of about this area here, hasn't it? All right, now the scene still has this um, area in here that I think it, it's kind of uh, left wide open for some sort of um, subject matter. Um, probably right back in this area right here unless I want to do something where, you know, something is like hidden in here and I put them some little deer or something like that in the shadow area. Um, but I think in here would be better. But I don't know. Let me think about that one. And um, let's get into some of these um, additional detailed marks, okay? Well, maybe not this one, so it might not be the details right now, but some of the uh, types of marks that I want to go for, and in this case, just taking a cotton swab and getting some... Yeah, this one's real... I thought this... Swab's really fraying on the end right here. Um, that might be too... I always say to kind of smash the tip, but that one's kind of really fraying. Eh, I don't like that little thing. I'm not going to have control over that. Let me use the other side. I like using these cotton swabs, the real cotton, not those really tightly wound, kind of more acrylic types. Um, this one, it's just a little bit more, it's kind of softer, so when I blot it down, it kind of starts smashing the tip and kind of loosening it up a little bit, okay? And um, if I'm going for something soft, a soft application, I don't want a, a real firm, tight applicator, right? You want it soft itself. So that's what this is for. And, um, okay, I've mentioned this every time I do these, um, this color box pigment ink, it's I always mention this, but not everyone watches, you know, someone could be watching this scene for the first time of all the videos where this has been done, so I always repeat myself here, but um, I'm not going with, this is color box, um, a frost white, okay, pad, and it's your pigment ink, alright? 
color box, the regular color box, um, it's a little bit slower drying, especially on glossy paper, okay? That's what I want. I want a slow drying ink, but I also don't want to take a cotton swab or something like that, especially if you have a fairly wet pigment ink pad and it's not really dried up, you know, over years of use. And um, when I get this onto this tip right here, what I'm doing is I'm taking some of it off where I'm not going to be applying it in a very quick manner onto the scene, okay? And I'm starting to apply it in lighter areas, okay? Because it'll really stand out quite a bit if I put it on black, okay? So you have to kind of add it into some lighter areas where you've retained some of the lightness of the uh, of the cardstock, preferably white. I mean, it could have a little bit of ink on here. But I start off there, and I start off with a light touch, okay? If there's a lot of ink left on the tip right here, it's going to apply it very fast, and you're going to have these big globs of ink, okay? So you want to really take that out like you're putting on an almost kind of powdery, light tapping of that ink. You don't want it to go on in one tap, okay? Like one tap, I could almost can't see anything at all. So upon repeated tappings, it keeps um, applying more and more of that very dry pigment ink on there. And that's how I'm able to apply it in a um, at a rate that I have a lot of control over it, okay? Now see, right throughout here, I mean, see that how it goes a little bit of pigment ink? It's kind of obscure, obscuring the background a little bit, but see these hard branches? I think it's better to not, you have to oscillate it, okay? So you have to leave some areas crisp. Otherwise, if I just do a big area of all that white in there, it looks weird, you know, when I look at it at a distance. You don't want it to have, there's just a gigantic, you know, area of like a oval or round, you know, area of uh, that um, texture, okay? So what I'm doing is I'm just kind of oscillating it I'm leaving some areas sharp and some areas, um, in this case, it would be kind of foggy. Now, you never have to worry about this ink right here when using it in this fashion because if you add too much, all right, all you have to do, if you don't like it, all you have to do is take, you know, clean eggs or paper towel and just rub it right off and it'll come right off. You're not going to be removing any of the ink, okay? The colored ink, okay? You'll be removing the pigment ink. It comes right off. If this dries on your card um, stock and let's say you've added too much, it's easy enough to, you can even rub it off with your finger, okay? And it'll come right off. It'll rub off the surface just fine. So sometimes what I do is I add it on and then if I don't like it, um, you know, I'm taking it off. So that always happens with me. Um, I kind of take things a little bit further than um, sometimes is ideal, I think, in a visual sense. You know, I just uh, go overboard, or when I'm doing this, I'm kind of focusing on one area. But, you know, every now and then when you're doing this type of detail, you kind of have to hold it out at arm's distance and take a look at the overall because when we're in like this, which we are when we're working on it, we're kind of focusing on one little area, you know, and we have to get kind of an overall perspective of what it looks like overall too. And that's where kind of holding it out at arm's distance periodically comes into play. Okay, every time I um, reapply some ink here, okay? I kind of blot it off a little bit, especially if it's kind of wet. You get a feel for um, how much ink is being applied um, 
to your tip here when you tap it in there. If it's really dry, you can just go straight onto the, you know, straight onto the card. And mine's a little bit, I have a little bit too much on there, so I can't go straight from pad to card, I don't think. Well, not so much. All right. I don't want to add too much in here. I like it. I'm keeping in mind, um, you know, that subject matter. Yeah, that subject matter might actually look good up here. So, speaking of that, rubbing it off, I'm just going in here and buffing it right out of there. Okay. I'm thinking now maybe I'll put that little subject matter right up there. Like a little deer or something. Doe. It might be nice. When I do this with my finger, I'm kind of removing some of that ink off of there. Or the pigment ink, that is. Going way back in the scene to when I first stamped out these trees, remember I kind of wiped off the bottom. Now I'm going back in at, at the base of these trees, I'm really adding in some additional pigment ink to expand on that um, notion of a, kind of a, this creeping fog, you know, at the base of the uh, trees. But see, in the impressions themselves, you know, we kind of have that transition of crisp and um, obscure, just as we're reiterating it with kind of a physical medium here. You know, so the, the impressions just, they're inherently just not there um, when it kind of fades off. So you're just kind of going back in and doing the same thing with this pigment ink, you know, you're adding something in, or in the impression it just wasn't there. In other words, it faded off. So, where it fades off, just go back and add some of this ink in here, this pigment ink look. Okay. I'm kind of adding quite a bit of this because um, the scene, the concept at least, was kind of about this fog rolling in, this cloud. I think it's more of like a cloud that came, you know, because we were, because we were up at elevation, so. Um, But again, from, you know, where this kind of, where the scene arrived at, um, it's not exactly, it didn't exactly turn into that. But we'll still kind of um, have a lot of this cloudy element in here. It, <laughs> I have a video too, I think, uh, on my Flickr account where you can actually see that fog rolling in. It's kind of interesting. I, lo I love watching kind of this moving mist, you know, just so close to you. You know, five feet away, you can see it kind of creeping along. OK, 
Okay, this is starting to come alive for me, especially right here, like in that area. And what we're doing here is, you know, after all, we're kind of we're kind of representing reflected light in here. Light is hitting moisture in the air, and it's reflecting this in itself. Is you know, you're kind of creating your, in some ways, your kind of sources of light within the scene itself. So it's like you're adding a spotlight. Now, I wouldn't want to add that much pigment ink in these darker areas, okay? Because so, in the shadows, all right, you're not going to have so much reflected light because just light isn't getting in there. But, so if I kind of add some of it <clears throat> in these darker areas like this, I have very little, so we have more and little. So we have light and dark, okay? Now, if, going back to spraying, if you ever add these types of touches to your scene, um, and if you spray it, if you've ever sprayed anything like chalks or pastels with a, a spray sealant, you'll know that um, the spray sealants can get... it can eradicate some of the finer, kind of lighter details within like a pastel um, piece or chalk piece. Everything gets darker, okay? And that's the same thing for this one. So if I spray this, I'm going to spray it with a very light coating, okay? And I'm going to let allow it to set up so it kind of seals the scene. If I give it a real heavy coat right away, I, I don't know, I might, you know, obliterate all of this effect right here because it'll just kind of disappear and everything in the background will show right through it. Um, so what you have to do is you just have to use a little bit more technique and touch with your sealant. In other words, just spray it from distance, spray it from two feet away and just give it a light spray, like, you know, and it coats it, seals it, and then what you can do is you can give it a heavier spray after that. What I usually do is I give it a light coating over the whole thing, maybe two, you know, but after one, I'll let it set up. You know, a few seconds is all it takes. Spray it again, and then what I'll do is I'll kind of aim the, the spray sealant can around the perimeter like that, okay? Because I want the edges to be fairly dark for that vignette effect, but I don't want to lose all the detailing that I achieved with the use of uh, this type of technique or the uh, like gel pens, stuff like that, um, in the interior, which is usually the lighter areas. I can feel it on this um, tip here, it's getting really, really um, dry. I could ink it up again, but I like the control over this. I can just tap away and not worry about getting kind of a real thick application, you know, or a blob of ink. All right. For right now, I think that's an enough of that pigment ink. So we have a lot of mist coming off the surface of the uh, scene. Kind of a cloud is moving in. All right. Some of that vibrancy of the green is knocked back a little bit. If I zoom in, you can see where I've added it at the base. Okay, so we have that little transition from intense to dull because I've added some pigment ink over it. Some of these little areas down here you can see where that pigment ink is at the base of it but I've left some of these branches you know alone as is so that there's a little bit of a transition going from you know in, in intensity over here at the base of the trees 
down here. I think that's really effective right in there instead of just having that all that same um, value of that branch we have over here where it it kind of bends it in space. Maybe that this branch over here is back a little bit farther or something like that. Okay, so we see that transition down here. It already transitioned a little bit because I, you know, I just stamped this out lighter to begin with, and then it was darker on the top. But you can see right here, this is probably all the same value, but you can see what that does right there. It, it just gives a little bit more dimension, okay? to these different things in here, that little glow right here of that um, picnic right in here. It says that the light is coming through maybe and hitting this little area where it's maybe it's a little bit darker right here. So those little details, I think, kind of add to the overall um, appearance, okay? Um, so it's not just light and dark, all right? We have light and darkness within all of the little elements that we've added as well. They're soft and crisp. You know, upon closer inspection, you know, you can see all those types of things. And I think overall it adds to a kind of a richer, I don't know, surface, you know, kind of a tapestry of, uh, I don't know, changing textures, soft and hard. So we're working with light and dark, soft and hard. Okay, let's see here. Let's go and add some um, gel pen highlights. I can add, this will be a good opportunity to use some of my Sharpie paint pens. I think this um, color right here would be interesting, maybe pink right there might be, or this violet might be interesting because that's the same kind of orchid color that this pad was, and this pad color is in here, so I think that this kind of detailing with that type of color would harmonize with this scene just fine because that color is already in there. Um, you don't think, you know, when I show this pad right here, it doesn't look like pink all the way around it, but but it is in there, and it's layered in there. So something like that might be good. And some of these areas, like in the trees and things like that, I can use some, perhaps some uh, different uh, alcohol um, marker effects, you know, for little detailed areas, okay? So I think this is um, where the scene, hopefully, will start to come alive even more um, with the use of these tiny little details like that. <laughs> what I always do, I always have this tendency of using little stars. I'm not going to do that in this scene. I'm going to have it kind of more alive down here, so these little twinkly lights um, from the use of these um, types of opaque marks um, will be the, uh, the thing. So, okay. I'm going to test out some of these pens here. I know that a couple of, some of these pens right here I hadn't used for years. I just kind of pulled out all of my uh, pens and I also need to change the battery of this camera. So let's do that. Okay, I just got these pens working here. These uh, Sharpie um, paint pens have this little rattling thing that kind of moves up and down the uh, barrel, and uh, I got that ink flowing. I just had to make sure these these tips here are fairly thick, and the thicker the tips of, you know, pens like um, gel pen, gel roller pens, and um, these ones have a little bit of a different tip. It's not a roller, it's, I don't know, it's more of that little tiny um, tip that's, in this case, it's fairly thick although it's called an extra fine point at, uh, you know, the, the mark it makes is fairly thick. So in other words, the thicker the ball, the less chance of it is, you know, has of uh, clogging on you from what I've found. Um, there were some manufacturers that I, I feel kind of rushed 
to get their products out on market back when, and they didn't test them so well, so things like gel pens, sometimes they would come and you'd buy them brand new and they'd be clogged, but I always had uh, good success with the Uniball Signo um, brand. Um, this one happens to be from Japan. All the markings on there are Japanese, but they make, um, you know, this is another kind of more domestic um, make right here, but it's the same thing, all right? But some of these I've had, you know, for years, and they've been sitting around, so um, they do end up clogging at times. But the way I figure it, you know, if I get... I mean, if, if two years of use or something like that off of uh, a pen is pretty good. This one right here I think I've had longer, but I think maybe the tip is, um, you know, the ball is, is bigger. Okay, same thing with the... Um, that I did with the uh, the pigment ink. I, I usually start the lighter areas. So if I start adding some of these um, little marks of white details in the darker area, it's really going to stand out because of the contrast. So I start in the lighter areas, and um, what this represents, I don't know. I mean, I mean, it could be different things. It could be little highlights um, in the grass on leaves or whatever, um, just where you have little areas of light. Like I said, it could be capturing some of that light. If you add enough of it in a certain pattern, these could be represent little, um, little flowers or something like that, pearly everlasting or whatnot, you know. In this case, um, when I went out and I looked at some of these different pens. Not that you have to, you know, be so literal in terms of your replication of something, but um, this area that I was in was at the end of summer, so we had a lot of the, uh, the, the bushes and things like that were already kind of, had already gone through their transition. They were really dry, but um, some of the, the flowers had that kind of, that you know, little seed ball or whatever. I don't know what it's called, but um, um, some of it was kind of white, and maybe that's what this is. But anyways, what it ends up being, it ends up being a little illuminated texture, okay? And, I mean, already I have some of it down here, here, here. It's kind of creating this pathway of light, okay? It doesn't have to be kind of a light coming from in the background. You could be making just kind of a visual pathway for your viewer, you know, to reiterate this idea of this, you know, kind of entryway into the scene. Now, I was thinking about some different things in this area, and I thought, you know, there's a lot going on at this point in time in this scene. I don't know if I want to add anything. I, I thought it, this area that I go, you know, in um, high gain or camping in, they, they do allow grazing, so there were, there's cows, not in the, this one specific area, but kind of in this one general area. I've hiked and you can hike through, you know, a bunch of grazing cows, and I, I put a couple in here, but it just didn't look right. So I'm not going to do that, but this scene may not have um, some kind of subject matter that I thought would be kind of appropriate for this open area, but the, the scene is so active right now with uh, this texture down here. I think I might just leave it as is and just kind of leave... Uh, these elements as the, I don't know, kind of the main subject matter. Um, if you haven't kind of added little textures like this before, one thing that the, um, it seems like the, uh, um, what, what 
what's the word I'm looking for? The, the common um, pattern that people start doing, including myself, is, is we start adding these little dots, kind of like in a pattern, they're all equally spaced, okay? And um, if you want these little transitions, you know, throughout the scene, you kind of have to cluster some up a little bit and then diffuse them. So we have a little bit, let me see if this is showing up on the video. Let me see if I can get in here. See this right here where I've added a little bit more. Then as I move into the darkness, there's less. I spread the dots out. Here's It's clustered and then nothing, right? So put a few here and there. Otherwise, what happens is you end up adding this kind of like polka dot pattern over the entire thing, and it looks kind of weird. So just as we transitioned from kind of thicker um, white pigment ink to thinner, in other words, light to dark, you're doing the same thing, but you're doing it with a little dot. So here's more, and then here's less, okay? So you transition it more to less, okay? More, less, okay? It's light, dark, okay? Here's some of it right in here. Just those few little dots right in here, you see it? But I don't have any down here, all right? I've just added a few. So there's none right in here. And let's see if we can see it. See, here's some right here, right there, and here, okay? So don't just add it all like an eighth of an inch or something like that apart from each other and have it just completely patterned like that. So here's more and less, more, less. So cluster, 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 okay? And if it's in a darker area out here, see there's more here than there is over here, okay? Same thing right here. Here's like four dots, but a couple little trailing dots out here, okay? So you see what I'm getting at. And um, there's no right or wrong area. It's just wherever you choose to put it. Um, but this idea of just oscillating it a little bit more um, than having it too consistent, um, I think just reads better. It's, I wouldn't call it random, but just kind of targeted, you might say. And this pen, I can kind of get a thicker dot or a thinner dot if I have this kind of on its at an angle as opposed to going more vertical. It seems to give me, you know, a different dot. And some of these dots, I, I kind of have them bigger, so I'm doing a little squiggle of that, you know, I'm drawing that um, dot bigger, okay? Just so I can vary the size of it a little bit, just so it's not so um, uniform everywhere. And just like the pigment ink, if you add too much in a given area, then just, you know, take a, you can take your finger or paper towel and, and just kind of rub that dot off or dots. It happens all the time. Um, with me, I might add in too much. All right. So. Uh, it's easy to go overboard with this, because once you get in the swing of it, it starts, uh, you know, <laughs> you start laying it down pretty fast. And like I said, in the darker areas, something like this really stands out. Okay, let's see. That was the white pigment, uh, white paint pen, excuse me. This is the um, lavender Sharpie paint pen pen. You can use a lavender gel pen or whatever, too. You might even do something like a, emboss something in here. Wouldn't that be cool? Or those, I forgot what they're called, liquid applique or whatever. Something like those might be kind of interesting. Okay, now this one I do believe is kind of, kind of represent um, like a, like a flower or something like that. I can intersperse it in with some of that white. It doesn't read to my eye, even 
from this distance of applying it. I, I, I can't see it that well, all right? But let's see if I can get this on camera. See these little areas like that, where they are, right in here. It adds to the visual richness and tapestry of the piece a little bit more, okay? See, it's just, just a little bit in here. Some of it is kind of obscuring some of that white dot, which is good. I've kind of layered it down a little bit more. But if you add this, you know, this is probably, I don't know, it's like a 50% value in, in terms of light and dark. So areas that I add it to, if I add it over kind of an area that's of the same value, it doesn't show up so much, but it does give it a little bit more texture and I think there's just a little, it looks a little bit more alive. You know, I enjoy stamping. Um, I enjoy the whole process. I enjoy watching something kind of happen, and it happens fairly slow, you know, slow, slowly, unlike, like, say, Chinese brush calligraphy or something like that, you know, and I love that too, but I'm just not really good at that type of thing, you, you really have to keep in practice with that, these people that do that type of thing, I, I love that look, I love watercolors, the spontaneity of it, but I love watching, you know, these scenes kind of evolve over time, in this case quite a long time, but um, what I'm getting at is I really love doing these finishing touches. I, I think it's it just kind of where the scene just, like I said, where it kind of comes alive. And I mean, I've done all this other work on here and it, you can't get to this point without that, but um, These little touches like that, it, it's like, um, it almost like it, it's kind of becoming about this in a way, even though they can be really subtle marks, but it's where all that contrast and richness kind of come out. Some areas, you know, like that white dot, it's the lightest thing in that little area, but in a very, very detailed way. Okay, that was the lavender again. Let's try the um, peach. Looks just like the peach Bellini, right? Something like that. Okay, this one's probably a little bit more yellow. This little dot right here is, uh, it's kind of warming things up a touch um, in those areas. Let me see if I can zoom down here. Forgive my... Um, shakiness as I take my tripod and move it in a little bit. Okay. I don't, you notice I don't always work on the scene, you know, completely vertical like this. I, I kind of turn it. In a way that um, I can reach something easier too. And one of the things you should know is um, this camera is right in front of my face. So I kind of have to kind of come at it 
underneath it a little bit when I'm doing these videos. But... Anyway, let me see. Can you see that? I'm just looking at my little video screen. You can see where it's kind of placed here and kind of throughout here. So let's kind of change that area. Let's let's do a compare and contrast, okay? You can see those little areas down here with those that trio of highlights, but let's look at it over here, okay? See the difference? This is kind of what it looked like, you know, before. I mean, it was darker in here to begin with, but you can see the, the difference between here and here with those little dots, right? Especially like back in here. I have a few of them, but... You can see how much more lively this is over here. But again, you know, don't just space them out perfectly evenly. You see it's kind of like up here in the transitions. So light, dark, light, dark. Right? Here's some more of it down here. I don't have too much of it in here. But so see what it you know, this kind of undulation, you know, of Maybe this could represent high, low, high, low, high, low. What do you have is dark light, dark light, dark light. It's kind of like a checkerboarding of um, value, texture. You know, so for something to kind of stand out a little bit, you have to have the contrast of it nearby. If we have it all the same texture throughout there, there's nothing to contrast it against. So. Those little highlights stand out more because right next to it there aren't any. Okay. All right. So that is that color. And um, huh. Let me try something here. Yeah. Now that is going to be way too red. Let's try something very light. Like, how about this? This is, um, I have no idea what color that is. A lot of you have, um, different kind of alcohol pens, Copics or whatnot, and various shades and hue. Um, I might just go and add some little marks here. Into this grassy area. I'm kind of adding, this is a very light value of a kind of a violet. That looks okay. I'm not sure. I mean, it has to dry before it kind of uh, reads a little bit more, but um, let's do something with how about Green. By the way, these are La Plume permanents. Any kind of, you know, brush marker type of um, alcohol-based pen would be great. One thing that's really good about alcohol pens is they won't um, blur water-based marks underneath it. So if I add this alcohol-based pen on top of the water-based inks, it's not going to make them run. Okay, I'm just kind of dotting this down in some of these shadows right here. Just to give it a little bit more of a texture, I guess you'd say. And to vary, I'm kind of varying the, uh, the, um, the application, you know, when you're doing all that sponging, it's going on in a very, you know, even way, you know, with the size of that tip right there, but, you know, doing these little additions right here, like in the shadows. Um, remember, if I add a light green on top of a darker background, it's not going to make that darker background seem light. These are all transparent, so just going on and adding some of this into the shadows a little bit. some of these areas of the grass. I would start off very light. If you don't like what you see, take a blender pen and kind of blend it in a little bit more, you know, spread it around. It'll spread the um, alcohol-based ink, but
but it won't smear the water-based underneath, the water-based, dye-based ones, okay. I think I mentioned before I was thinking about putting something on these um, branches right here. Let's see if I have kind of a rusty red tone. This one's some kind of brown. Oh, it's called coffee. I didn't even realize it. I for, or I forgot about the names of the... Ah, uh, oh, that one's way too dark. <laughs> Let's try... This one is called... Oh, here, sepia. Yeah. Let's add some of this in here. Let me add that to some of these branches. Yeah, pretty good. Let's say it, these branches had some kind of little um, flower bud that's kind of dried over the summer. This could end up being the longest uh, of all of my instructional videos, which is saying a lot because some of them are kind of the Lord of the Rings in length, but um, my memory card filled up, so I just went and downloaded all that uh, to my computer, and I'm back hours later because I had to compile all those uh, files into one. Um, before erasing them off my uh, memory card, but um, I'm back. The card has dried a little bit, so there's less of a kind of a saturation. It'll come back though when I spray this. But um, I was looking at this, and uh, this is one of those scenes that um, obviously I'm not rushing through, but um, at this point in time, I'm thinking I might as well just keep taking it as far as I can. And um, I have this uh, green, kind of a pastel green um, Sharpie paint pen. And on some of these green leaves in here, I'm going to add a little bit of depth to them. Maybe some of these tr uh, leaves are a little bit lighter in some areas than other areas. So instead of that being kind of a monochromatic, uh, leaf in there. Well, it's monochromatic, but it's kind of monotone in terms of its value. I'm going in here and adding some uh, lightness to um, some of these leaves, giving them a little bit of dimension. Maybe where these green leaves are uh, in kind of the lighter areas, maybe I'll add um, few more of these dots to it, um, these light dots representing a lighter leaf, and um, uh, I think it's really helping it. Um, those leaves back there, they were a little bit, um, uh, they were a little bit plain, I would say. And this is a way to go in there and to give it a little bit of dimension, okay? Always good to take a look at it from a distance. Maybe some areas in here could stand to use a few little highlights. Okay. Okay. Some of these um, trees, these leafless trees, could use a little bit of uh, extra tone. And let's see, what color should I do then? Then let's start really light. I mean, so light that I'm probably not even going to be able to tell. Um, 
that has been laid down, apricot and beige, two warm tones. They kind of relate to the, uh, let me see if I can get these to focus in, they kind of relate to the uh, color scheme, okay? But I always like to start light if I can, if I have the media on hand. Actually, I do kind of see it a little bit. Um, Kind of warming the tree up a little bit, the trunk. I don't know if you can see this or not. Let's see if the camera can pick it up. Okay. Let's see it right in here. I see the difference between, like, say, this one and this one. Okay. It's just kind of adding a, a little bit of. Definitely temperature, maybe a little bit of dimension. Okay. Yeah, you should. That's kind of reading a little bit. All right. Now, how about? some of that other, I think I just added the apricot, let's see, uh, this one right here, the, oh, this is back to sepia, is that the one? no, here it is, this one was uh, beige, let's try the beige, some of the sepia down here in this manzanita branch. Let me pull out a little bit. Okay. It's kind of fleshing in some of these uh, other branches here and there. tempted to use some of this in these trees, but um, I don't want to do that. I, I, I want to keep those that reddish bark, you know, looking like a different, um, um, different surface color than, uh, than those kind of pine tree skeletons. All right, and I tell you what, there's some of those greens down there. Let's let me try some of this in here too. Let's warm up some of that tone. This is a uh, apple green, light green. Let's add that to some of those um, green leafy plants. And again, th this is the uh, alcohol-based pens. They're transparent, so I don't see like a, you know, little dot of green like that because it's just anything underneath it is showing through. Okay. Let's 
been quite some time since I spent so much time on uh, kind of the surface texture of a kind of a grassy area like that. But that is a lot of fun, though. I should do that more often. Just uh, maybe not in the not in my next scene. Okay, yeah, this is gray. Cool gray. Actually, that's a little bit too light. Let's try. Um, what do we have here? Brownish gray. Hmm, that'll be a good one. Maybe I'll do it on the outside edges of these. Some of these trees. Okay, so the light is coming from in here. So on the inside um, area of the uh, line of the uh, trees, I, I, I won't add this. You know, so we can kind of turn these in space a little bit, adding a little bit of shade on this side to the right side of the uh, the tree and branches. And on this side, they'll be on, you know, that shading will be on the left-hand side, so let me turn this so I can access it. All right, a little bit better. Uh, those trees, uh, they have a little bit more dimension to them, I would say. They just kind of fleshed in a little bit more, a little bit more prominent in terms of a solid. Uh, and they're a little bit more reflective of the, uh, the lighting scheme. All right, now we've gone in here and we've added a lot of different textures. The textures have all been laid on top of the pigment ink touches that we've put in there, okay? But now, because this isn't necessarily a, uh, you know, a linear process of just going from A to whatever, M, Z, whatever you want to say, um, we can always go back, like I added some of their tones before, you know, in the beginning, then I've added them over the top of it, but this is going back and kind of looping back around to um, this pigment ink application, and what I'm doing is we created variation in the surface um, with the use of this texture before, but now we've um, added other texture on top of that, that texture on top of it is reading a certain um, a certain sharpness to it. Now I want to vary some of that so that all these little dots might not be the same exact um, value and again sharpness. Okay, I might want some of it to be a little bit more um, obscure lighter, duller, okay, let's see, I gotta get this, I'm using a new cotton swab here, the last one was, uh, <laughs> was really frayed, okay, let's see, let's, so I'm knocking this down and kind of smashing the tip a little bit, and applying This is a technique that I, you know, I use almost all the time, but, um, you know, with most scenes, I, I don't use it quite as much, you know, as this one. This one's getting kind of more special treatment, I guess. Oh, 
by spending more time on this one because I've been thinking about this, um, this setting for a while and wanting to get back up to this area you know, ever since I saw that. Add some around uh, these trees, the tree base. Okay, now one of the things I failed to mention before is this is uh, the color box pigment ink. Okay, there's different types of uh, pigment inks. Some of them are they're designed to dry faster than, um, say, this one. And that could work, but I would use it in conjunction with a slow drying one. This is just so easy to apply and to remove if you want to. The fast drying ones are, once you lay them down, they're pretty well set. You, you might be able to remove it a little bit, but, um, but it's not going to be as easy. They've been kind of designed to be, you know, to dry on glossy cardstock and quickly, so they really set up very fast which is kind of the opposite um, um, a result that you want from it in terms of using it like this, okay? If you're stamping like a word stamp on something, you know, you want it to, you know, dry quickly and set up. Um, but in something like this, you don't. But that being said, sometimes um, when I'm laying down this pigment ink, I can only lay down so much in this thin little layer like this. Um, I can't really build it up too much most of the time. You know, if I keep trying to build it up, sometimes it, what ends up happening is you end up removing it um, off the uh, off the scene. And that being said, sometimes in these areas, if I want it to be a little bit lighter, um, what I have to do is I have to go in over the top of it with um, some of that um, faster drying um, pigment ink. I'm trying to remember the name of it. I think it's Brilliance. That one dries very quickly. I don't know. They might have all kinds of new ones. I see these other ones out all the time. You know, there's a lot of them I haven't even heard of. And someone might ask me, okay, well, would this one work? And uh, a lot of the times I don't even know because uh, there were so many uh, different types of inks coming on the scene at one point in time. But usually you'll know if, a, if one's kind of a faster drying one than another. The ones you emboss with are typically not the fast drying ones. That's why you can uh, emboss with it. You know, the powder sticks to it. And the faster drying ones, the powder usually doesn't stick to it. Or if it does, you yeah, really have to get it on there quickly. All right, I think we're getting close here. I've added a little bit too much just as it stands, but I know that when I spray this, some of this is going to kind of just blend into the background a little bit more. I'm going to lose some of the more subtle areas, and the areas where I've added a lot are going to kind of, you know, mellow out a little bit. They're not going to be quite so prominent. So I don't think I'm going to, you know, worry about that at all. But anyway, we have a nice rich surface on this finished scene. I don't see anything more that I want to add. Um, sometimes I, you know, I, I've added highlights on like foreground areas here with white paint pen, uh, not white paint pen, but the white gel pen. Um, but on this one, I don't want to do that. It, it, there's already so much detailing going on in here that uh, 
I just think it would be too much. Okay, let me see. Let me see if I can get in here a little bit closer, so you can see the uh, surface of that. See all those little dots in here. Right in here, those little green dots on top of that green leafy texture, I think, really stands out nicely. The manzanita in here, reddish branches, looked good with a little bit of that extra um, alcohol-based uh, pen. We have this nice little transition. You can see these little and let me see how close I can get in here. See these little dots as it transitions here, through here. Okay. And we have a nice oscillation between, see, the sharp areas of these branches. Some of them are a little bit more obscure with the uh, pigment ink, but we still have the sharpness of some of these branches. That is what, for me, the scene kind of ends up being about, you know, is the uh, the contrasts happening down in those areas. And the light areas in here, you know, with the uh, illuminated mist, um, it's kind of fun. So it's kind of a nice contrast with the, uh, the overall kind of uh, dominant shapes of the scene of the, uh, the dead trees. So we have this really soft, shimmery areas amongst, you know, what could be kind of more of a you know, done in a different tone, kind of look like a haunted forest or something like that, but it really seems to shimmer and be alive. And uh, uh, not necessarily what I was thinking about or referencing, but um, I think I want to do another scene too, you know, maybe with this, you know, much more simplistic and a darker scene, you know, with uh, possibly some different values of those trees, you know, lighter ones in the background and darker ones up front or something like that, just an uh, overall mauve haze or something like that. But uh, anyway, uh, gosh, if you've sat through and watched this whole scene, I hope you've enjoyed it, enjoyed the process, and uh, uh, I give you a lot of credit for that. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to be able, get be able to sit through this and watch it. I guess I'll have to, to put the annotations in here. But anyways, thanks so much for watching, and uh, hope you uh, enjoyed uh, all of those little changes that took place. <laughs>